Go. Okay, sorry about that. It takes a minute to get it loaded up. So, good morning, everybody. Um, I assume you're all keen on dragonflies or interested in dragonflies or damselflies, so I don't think I need to sell them to you. But um, so there's lo there's so much to pack in, and it was difficult to decide what to include and what to leave out. So I'm going to start with just a general introduction, um, uh, including um, resources, books, and websites and things to help you um, identify and learn more about dragonflies. Um, then a um, section on uh, just a brief biology and ecology of dragonflies. Then I'm going to spend a lot of time on general ID tips, and I think that's that's the thing that I'm hoping people will learn today. You're not going to learn, you're not going to learn how to identify every dragonfly you're going to come across, but to learn, to, to have the tools, to learn the sort of things you need to be looking at, the parts of the dragonfly that will help you um, um, narrow it down to that particular species. Um, and then at the end, just a, a small bit, if people are interested about um, garden pollens. So, and you're you're interested in us, so you're you're interested in dragonflies. They're they're just amazing animals that are so um, they're just such adept predators. You can see a um, a black-tailed skimmer eating a wasp, I think. Um, and um, both as larvae and adults, they're um, just voracious predators. They're important habitat and climate change indicators. And um, there's lots of myths about them. So they're Welsh names, uh, the dragonfly of Gwasanaidr and um, Myrsen for damselfly. Um, they don't sting people. They have a lot of names that, that um, imply that they sting. They don't sting at all. They might come and have a look at you, but they won't bother you at all. They can't bother you. And um, yes, unique sexual behavior, which we will get to shortly. Um, they're, incredibly ancient, um, earlier than dinosaurs. And um, over 300 million years ago, they had that the same basic wing shape and form. It's such obviously such a good, des good design that it's lasted all this time. They were huge. There was much more oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, insects don't have lungs. They have, uh, they're called spiracles. So they just sort of, um, the air sort of diffuses in. And um, so now, because there's less oxygen in the atmosphere, that limits the size of insects. So it was the size of a kestrel. It's just amazing. Um, there's been 37 species recorded in Wales, although there are new species arriving all the time and spreading and starting to breed. Um, about 20 are wide, fairly widespread now. And what I'm going to cover today are the dragonflies and damselflies that we have in our region and that you probably still have a bit of time to see. So there's a, a, a one early dragonfly, which I haven't included because you won't see that now. Um, and um, I might briefly mention some other less common ones, but just really briefly. And when I talk, say dragonflies, I'm generally, unless I'm specifically going through the dragonflies, I'm referring to both dragonflies and damselflies which I will explain the difference in a minute. A little bit of um, recent research showing um, the, the recent trends. So 31% of our already established species have expanded their range, which we think is due largely to climate change as it's getting warmer and more suitable for them. Also because of conservation work that's increased the number and um, also improved the quality of our wetlands but almost 20% have declined and, and the, that's not fully understood why, why that's happened. Um, there's been three extinctions in the 20th century, although one of them, the rather, um, oh, I don't know how to describe it, dainty damselfly, terrible name, but anyway, that is recolonizing Kent. Um, and there are at least five new species have um, bred here, sometimes maybe for a season or two, and then they die out. But a number of them are, are proving um, very successful. And the small red damselfly um, is one of the species that has 
um, turned up in Wales. In fact, at the uh, Millennium Wetland Center, I see Brian and other people are here on this course. So, um, so, so I get so thirsty doing these courses, all this talking. So water is the essential um, factor for them breeding. They will, you will see them out and about um, in different habitats, anywhere where there's insects, they'll be flying around and feeding. But to breed, they need water and they need good quality water. Um, they need the structure of aquatic plants. There's only a few species that need a particular plant. You can see all the important habitats, basically all still water. And um, there's a few damselflies that breed in rivers and streams. And there's a very few species, I'm not sure we have any in Wales, that actually can survive in um, brackish water, so partly salty water. But I think they're only in sort of Kent. They also shelter and, and also mature. So when they emerge, they go off to away from the water mature. And the females tend to only come to water when they want to lay it, when they want to breed and lay it. So this is what we're missing, the experience of actually being out and seeing dragonflies for real, but I'll do my best to give you a flavor of um, what they're like. So we, we'll send you a handout afterwards and you don't need to scribble down notes furiously. There's lots and lots of books about dragonflies but these are the sort of key identification guides. Um, the two on the top left are both really, really good. Um, the Small Shire book is, uses photographs, and the other one is um, illustrations by Richard Lewington, who's a fabulous um, wildlife illustrator. Um, so I can recommend both of those books. There's also the Field Studies Council guide. So those are very inexpensive. I think they're 354 pounds and they're laminated fold out guides. So they're really handy to take out with you, obviously much less information. Um, and if you um, get really interested and wanna actually start doing palm dipping and learn to identify the larvae and the exuvia, exuvia which I'll explain in a bit, then the Steve Jam book is also really useful and it's really pretty simple key to use on that. The two at the bottom are Europe's dragonflies, but I would say unless you already are familiar with dragonflies and or are planning on traveling to Europe, I wouldn't recommend them for beginners because there'd be many, many, many more species that will um, just confuse you. You'll be wasting time. Um, trying to find things that in fact are only in the Mediterranean. Um, there, I have a really good smartphone app made by bird guides, but they don't seem to be um, selling it anymore. Um, so there's only these two Dragonfly ID apps that I could find and I've not used either of them. Um, so um, yeah, sadly, there's not a lot of um, help there. British Dragonfly Society, who have kindly lent me the bones of this presentation and are a fabulous, very small charity. Um, I highly recommend looking at their website. Um, it's not to sell it, but their membership is very cheap. I think it's 20 pounds a year for an individual. Um, and they have a small section about um, dragonflies and whales. Uh, very, very good ID help and um, um, loads of fabulous photographs. They've also got um, a dragonfly photograph library, which, which is where I've gotten a lot of these photographs from that anybody can use. And I'll talk about pond management at the end, but they've got a lot of resources, um, giving a lot of advice about, about that. And um, also, I'll give, we'll send you links to all of that. They've also got um, a fairly new feature showing top sites. So as you can see, they've got a map um, including top sites in our area. These are just a few other um, websites. Again, I will send you the links that just have lots of um, good information, photographs, um, and information about what's flying. Now the Dragonfly Society as well has uh, come to it a bit later, but they have a page where you can click the time of year 
on type of habitat, and then it'll give you a list of the uh, dragonflies you're likely to see. Um, of course, um, rec recording is very important. All records are really important. Um, the Dragonfly Society have a number of their own recording schemes. Um, and um, they ask one, one really good thing to do is pick sites, adopt a site, or at least when you go out, make a complete list of what you see because the negative records, what you don't see, is as important as what you do see. Um, send you a copy of this so you can have the names to our um, county recorders in the area. And of course, submit your records to WWBIC um, or, um, or um, Adarin, which is, covers the whole of Wales. And there's two really easy to use recording apps, um, iRecord, which is the whole UK, and Lurk Wales, which is all of Wales. And um, the Adarin website is also really useful for uh, checking out the distribution of different dragonflies. You can see whether they've been recorded in your area. Right, so Odonata is the whole group of dragonflies and damselflies. Anisoptera are the dragonflies, and that means unequal wings. And they hold their wings out at uh, 90 degrees. Um, Zygoptera are the damselflies, and that means equal wings. And they um, almost always hold them together over their abdomen. They're also smaller and much less powerful flyers. So, the life of the dragonfly. Um, probably should have started with the larval stage first. They spend most of their lives as larvae and they only become adults to breed, lay eggs, and then they die like many insects. <clears throat> Pardon me, they're so hoarse. Um, so the male has special claspers, which I think we'll see in a minute, and he grabs the female by the back of her neck. It's not very, uh, not much foreplay. Um, and you can see yeah, here that they actually have special, uh, their claspers, as they're called at the end of the male abdomen, are specially adapted to fit the neck of the neck. They're not officially called the neck, but the um, female damselfly of that species. You do occasionally see species that are not the same species attached. They can't successfully breed as far as we know. Um, and then, he um, so he produces the sperm um, low down on his abdomen, and then he transfers it to a equivalent of a penis up at the top of his abdomen. And then, if she wants to mate with him, she curls her abdomen round to join with him, and then the sperm is actually transferred. Um, if she doesn't want to, then she won't curl her abdomen around. Um, then immediately the females start laying eggs. So some of them, um, and ovipositing is egg laying. Um, some species, the male holds on to the female. They, they um, oviposit in tandem. And in the case of some of these, they, they lay their eggs in, most of them, not always, most of them lay their eggs in plants. So they'll insert them in plants or lay them underside, under plants. And some of the damselflies even submerge in the water to lay their eggs. And so the male, it's thought the male partly holds on to um, help her, help her re-emerge from the water. But also he's trying to keep other males away and you'll often see other males will come and they'll, they'll be like barging in and trying to tap him and knock him off and that. There's a huge competition to um, uh, mate, mate to find receptive females. Um, they actually, their penises, are specially adapted. They're, I forgot to, I should have found a photo of them. All sorts of weird spikes and things. They can actually clear out sperm from the previous male before they deposit their own sperm. Um, female emperor dragonfly will oviposit on her own. And she will make slits in the vegetation. She's got a special tool to make slit in the vegetation and lay her eggs in that. Some of them some of the dragonflies just fly along and flick their eggs in. They don't even insert it, insert them. 
So the larvae, this is actually what they mainly are. Um, typically one to two years, but they can, some species are larvae for as long as six years, going through molts, shedding their skin so they can grow, whereas adults are days or weeks. Um, so you've got three basic types of larvae and they, they do reflect the size, the shapes of the adults. So you've got your damselflies at the top and they breathe through these little leafy structures called caudal lamellae. Um, and then we've got the two different um, groups of dragonflies. You've got your big hawker type emperor on the left. And then a darter, you've got darters, skimmers, and chasers, which are more squat dragonflies on the right. And they breathe through their bottoms. Um, they're, as I said, they're voracious feeders. They have this um, structure called a labrum or a mask, which at rest they fold under their chin. If they had chins under their chins, and you can see that on the um, exuvia on the Right, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, but when they catch something, they shoot this labrum out at speed faster than our eyes can see. And they've actually got movable teeth at the end so they can grab them. They're just amazing. And I, I, didn't, I don't have permission to use a video, but if you just Google dragonfly larvae feeding, you'll find there's a few really good videos online that uh, slow it down and you can actually see. And they can, they'll, again, they'll catch any, anything they can catch, they will eat. Some of them can even, the larger dragonflies can catch small fish, like just amazing. Um, and they have different strategies. Some are hunters and some are more uh, lie in wait and will camouflage. Some of them like under the, uh, under the sediments at the bottom and then we'll leap out as something passes. So that's why larvae need those pond weeds or debris or sediment either to cling to or to hide underneath. Obviously they need um, a lot of other insects and, and other invertebrates to feed on. Most of them don't tolerate polluted water. Um, there is a risk of, um, they do get predated. My pond that I dug for all sorts of wildlife, but especially for dragonflies, has now become a um, palmate newt reserve. And I love the palmate newts, but we have hardly any dragonflies now. A bit of a, bit of a wildlife person's dilemma there. And they also need places to actually emerge, which I'll show you in a minute. So this is just a sequence, which I'll go through quickly, showing a southern hawker dragonfly larva emerging. So day length and also temperature are cues. Some dragonflies tend to emerge, uh, all of them emerge around the same time, otherwise they're much more um, scattered temporarily through the summer. Um, so the last few days, it's, so it's amazing, they don't, they don't pupate like a butterfly. So they make the transition from being an underwater um, animal to being a big flying insect. Um, and so the last few days they, they stop feeding and they stop, they, sorry, they start breathing air and their jaws develop. So that's why they need some kind of vegetation to crawl out of the water and to hold on to. So you can see they cling on um, and their legs are so strong to hold on while all this takes place. The thorax, the back of the top part of their body here, splits and you can just see the dragonfly starting to emerge. Um, the completely comes out, well almost completely comes out and then just has to hang there. So again, like I said, that the legs are are so strong that even though that's now an empty, almost an empty shell, it's still able to hold on. And they have to rest to um, pump up and, and um, harden, harden their own legs, the, the adult dragonfly's legs, about 30 minutes. Then eventually the, um, they pull themselves up, they sort of come around, pull themselves up, and when their legs are strong enough that then they can cling on with their adult legs 
and um, they've extracted their whole um, abdomen. And then they start pumping expand, uh, liquid into their wings to expand their wings. And here, everything is fully expanded. So that takes, in this case, it took about two hours. And as you can see, the sort of milkiness of the wings, that's a sign that it, you've got a recently emerged dragonfly. They're called tenerals. And it rests for a while till the wings are really fully hardened um, before they can fly. Um, so here we see a tenerel of the same species. Not only are their wings milky, but their um, mature colors haven't fully developed. So they tend to be quite pale and or they look, they resemble the female coloration. And then at the bottom, we can see the fully mature male there. Um, they're very vulnerable while they are emerging, both to predators here being um, predated by ants in my pond when I did have dragonflies and um, spiders and birds. Um, even frogs, if they're if they're low down on a stem, can, and also weather. They tend to emerge at night to avoid predators, but they can be hit by poor weather and sometimes just malformations. Just their wings don't emerge properly and they can't fly. So they leave behind their outer um, uh, skin there, um, called exoskeleton, which is called an exuvia or exuvii plural. And at this stage, they're very under-recorded. So going back to the Steve Jam book, I'd, um, it'd be great if more people could start learning how to identify the larvae. It's not that difficult. Uh, you probably do need a microscope, um, but even a hand lens will help you um, because we have very few records of um, exuvii, which shows that, that dragonflies have successfully bred in that water body. And that's the real crucial thing. It's the shortage of um, suitable and unpolluted water that restricts the distribution of dragonflies for the most part. Also, they need lots of insects to feed on. And again, we saw the um, slide showing you the various shapes of the larvae. And you can see again the same shapes, obviously, in their outer skin from their final instar stage. And you can just collect them um, if you look around a pond or the edges of a water body. Um, you can see them there, and so they're really interesting, and you can identify them to species from the exuvia as well as the larvae. They get washed away by rain. And again, so we've seen the picture already on the right of the mask, the other one showing the top of the head, and a, a bit of a dark photo, but shows you their jaws. So those very um, scary teeth. Right, so a bit more about the biology. So their eyes are, are fabulous. You know, they're, they're predators, really, really skillful predators. So obviously sight is really important to them. Um, and they hunt from behind and below. So they have most of these facets um, at the top and in front where they have the best, where they need the best sight. They can see in color and also in UV light. And they are very, very sensitive to detecting movement. Um, they have two pairs of wings. You can read all those sort of details for yourself. They um, can manipulate the wings independently. They're incredibly maneuverably. Fly, uh, can fly up, back, can glide and hover. They can mate on the wing. They feed on the wing. They're just, just incredible. And they have those big thoraxes to, to power, where the muscles are to power those wings talked about their, um, their very sharp teeth as larvae and again um, mandibles not teeth um, but very very sharp in the adults they um, <coughs> pardon me they'll actually kind of bring their legs up and hold the food um, in a sort of basket shape and they're eating a bumblebee so get on to the general all sorts of clues about how to identify them. So um, I can say we'll send you slides of these sort of, um, send you copies of these slides. So um, as you see, there's only the two damselflies that lay their egg. 
in our area that lay their eggs in running water. There's also a white lake damselfly, which used to be on the Taiwi and I think on the Taui as well. Um, but it's not been found recently. It's not there on the Wai and other rivers in, in um, southeast Wales. And I think, I think further north, but in east Wales. Um, and then you've got the strong hawker group and their um, relatives that are um, very strong flying, and the other ones perch more. Um, a bit of um, anatomy here, and the main things really that you just need to learn are um, the thorax, which I've already mentioned, so where all their muscles are, the kind of powerhouse. Um, if you get more into dragonfly, I don't think I'm gonna actually talk about the pronotum, it's just that little area above the thorax is sometimes useful in identification. Pterostigma is just a little spot on the wings, which sometimes helps you tell species apart. And then um, the abdomen is the whole long, pointy bit to be technical and um, the segments so there's 10 segments altogether so segments one and two and then also the last three segments eight nine and ten uh, the markings on there are very often really the key to um, distinguishing species I just mentioned the legs to remind me when I was mentioning um, about they fold their legs, uh, their legs up when they've caught prey. Um, you can see all those sort of spikes on this banded demoiselle's legs that help them hold, hold their prey in place. Um, and then a dragonfly. Again, the pterostigma, abdominal segments um, tend to be more the upper um, abdominal segments of the, of the sorry, the segments sort of one and one and maybe two are more um, important with dragonflies less so eight nine and ten um, so it's generally the pattern on the abdomen um, those segments at the top and also the uh, markings on their thorax so they have these anti-humeral stripes this anti-humeral region at the top also sometimes the pattern on the side and occasionally the costa which is this very thickened um, vein at the top of their wings. Sometimes the color of that is uh, just in a few species is important. So the difference between dragonflies and damselflies, we've seen dragonflies rest with their wings open. Damselflies, except for one species, um, rest with their wings closed. Um, also their eyes, so dragonflies, their head is, um, it makes our head look very large because the whole front of their head is eye. There's no gap between them. Whereas down flies, their eyes are at either side of their head. Um, their dragonfly is more robust, more strong, pur purposeful flight. Down flies are all very slim, but much weaker, fluttering flight. And then we can group them into these, these various groups, which we'll now go through shortly. So these are all the features that we're going to be looking at. And um, so, and, and as I sort of already hinted, um, the stripes on the top and the size of the thorax and the colors on the top and the bottom of their abdomen are the most important, most commonly used features. On certain species, these other features come into play. So just examples, so looking at the heads, you can see with the damselflies, their eyes are, are bulge out on either side, sort of like a barbell. And dragonflies, they're completely cover um, the um, front of the head. It's markings on the thorax. So on the damselflies, you're often looking at, say that, so in these two, these are, are two common blue damselflies, which um, are really um, good pair of species. You will, they're almost everywhere around water. Um, so you can start practicing getting your eye in for these. So it's the width of these stripes on the top, and then also this little spur on the side. The azure has a spur and the common blue does not. We'll go over that when we get to those species, but those are the areas you're going to be looking at. And on the dragonflies as well, looking at, you're looking at the top of their abdomen and also on a few species looking at the patterns on the side. 
Um, these, so these are the um, top of the abdomen, seg segment two, um, the patterns, and uh, occasionally with dragonflies, the color are the key. And then um, with damselflies, often it's segments eight, nine, and 10, and sometimes it can be quite, that's quite tricky to tell the difference unless you had both of them together in your hand. It's not always easy to see these, um, how much of the segment is covered in blue and that sort of thing. Dragonflies, it's more the overall pattern and overall look of the abdomen. And the wings, so not that many species, but in the damselflies, we've only got these two species with colored wings, and I think we'll get to them quite soon, early on in the damselflies. And then the dragonflies, some of the um, species have colored bases to their wings. Um, four spotted chaser, which has an extra pair of spots on its wings, and also some of um, recent colonists, which I'm not really going to go into because I don't want to overwhelm you. But their veins, the color of their veins is also important. There's red vein darter and yellow wing darter. So behavior is also really helpful, I believe. Particularly with um, the dragonflies, but in the damselflies as well, the way they fly. Um, but with the big dragonflies, some of them are hawkers that are hawking back and forth, flying around um, incessantly, whereas um, the chasers and the darters tend to perch more often and they'll hunt out from, they'll sit on a perch and when they see an uh, insect flying by to feed on, or a female to pounce them then they'll fly off and they often come back to the same perch. Um, and, I'll, and for a few species in particular, time of year. So hairy dragonflies only flies in the spring, so I'm not going to cover that today. Um, it's really important to, I mean, do check the time of year when you're trying to identify a dragonfly. You won't see hairy, down, uh, hairy dragonfly after June. Um, and check on books or on websites about distribution. There's a number of species that are only in Scotland. Um, <clears throat> until a few years ago, we could say there's a number of species that are only in the east of England or southeast, but a number of them are spreading, so you need to keep an eye out for them. The habitat specialists you won't find in poor habitat. And then the thing that we can't really do today because we can't go out and see them is just that combination of experience you learn through through a, a combination of characters that you learn through experience. And um, often it, it's the way they fly or where they fly. Some of them fly out over open water. Some of them are more around the edge, things like that. Some other tips, close focusing binoculars or a monocular really, really useful for identifying dragonflies because most of them, you can't get close to them. They'll just float off. And to see those little features really helps a lot. Um, excellent conditions are mixed cloud and sun because then you can watch them fly. The big dragonflies are really hard. You know, it's hard to identify them as they're flown. Um, but keep an eye on them. And then if cloud comes, they'll often settle. And if you can see where they've settled and you've got the binoculars, then you've got a great chance of getting a good look at them. Um, photo, uh, photography is excellent. And then some of our like rarer species and, and um, more recently discovered species have been found through photographs because people only realized when they got home, looked at the photos, that there was something different about them. Um, they can see almost 360 degrees. Um, they can't see right behind themselves. So if you are approaching them, trying to get closer, approach from the back, and obviously it takes patience and experience, and it takes time. You learn a few species, and you gradually build and build on that. I always recommend with anything start early in the season because there aren't some, that many species around and then um, and then you can gradually build up and you see something you don't recognize it so then you can add to what you know. So this is that page um, that I was saying and I'll send you um, a link to this so you can click on the time of year, the type of habitat and the main colors and it will give you a list of likely species. Right. This is the hard part. That all sounds great. Oh, it's nice and easy, but of course it's not always that easy. So I said tanner rolls don't um, always have their um, adult coloration. 
So um, they can be difficult to ID and you could mistake them for, often mistake them for females. Look for those milky wings and definitely don't try to catch them because you can, their wings aren't fully hardened. <clears throat> and they'll go off for a while, you know, days to maybe, I'm not sure how long, if it's long as a week till they fully mature. And obviously till the sperm and eggs develop before they'll come back to the pond to mate. Um, males, most dragonflies that you see, most dragonflies by water will be males. Um, they're coming and they will, some of them um, are very, some of them aren't, but some of them are very territorial. So that can also tell you that they're males and they're um, looking for females and competing for females. Um, females, the real complication with them is that some species that come in different color forms. The one thing is that you'll usually see them when they're mating. And so you can identify them by the male, or if you see the male and you know it's one of the particular colors, then you know that, that obviously that's a female. But with age, species get dull and can be harder to identify. So um, example of the common darter, so you're kind of freshly mature uh, male in the middle, and then we've got um, aging males on the right, and the mature, the fresh female, and an aged material, uh, material where that come from, an aged female on the bottom right. Okay, hope everybody's still there. So now we're going to do a whirlwind tour through the more common damselflies of West Wales. So we'll start with the um, two damselflies, demoiselles, with colored wings. So they are really easy to identify. So they are the ones that you'll see by flowing water. We've got the banded demoiselle, that's um, just got that big blue patch on his wing. Um, beautiful iridescent colors. The female is um, not as bright, but she's still gorgeous, bright, em shiny emerald green with a green tinge to her wings. And then the other one, the beautiful demoiselle, where the male the male's wings are fully colored and he's very blue. Um, so the banded demoiselle tends to be on more slow flowing rivers. Um, with silty beds and is more tolerant of polluted waters. Um, the beautiful demoiselles on faster flowing clean streams and rivers with um, not such silty beds, gravel or sandy beds. So it's more of a specialist. Beautiful. And they um, they are the only damselflies that, that um, show um, they have like a mating, they're very territorial and they have this sort of mating display. So this is, I don't know if you can see it with green background. This is in Carmarthenshire in our area. Um, the male um, kind of performing, flashing his, his wing spots at the female down at the bottom. And in this case, actually, I just realized she looks like she's laying eggs. So he's more just keeping an eye on her or keeping other males away. But they do do that dance. Right, this is one of our very commonest species. Common on um, ponds and our earliest species to emerge. Large red damselfly. It's really small, but it's larger than the small red damselfly, which I'm not going to go over. Um, that is in uplands and heathlands, so I'm sure it, it is in West Wales, but um, it's, it's definitely, I've seen it at um, uh, Trigaran, Korskaran, and Keredigin. Um, but generally, if you're not in the uplands and the only red damselfly you're going to see is the large red damselfly, and it does have some black markings on the um, tip of its abdomen. Right, onto the blue damselflies. These are probably the trickiest ones. Um, blue tailed damselfly, theoretically, isn't that difficult. The problem is, we've got some rare damselflies with blue tails. Um, but we're going to just look at this, another really common species. Um, so it's got an all black abdomen with just blue at the um, base of its, uh, at, the, at the end of its abdomen. And it often 
sometimes when it's just, they, they almost hover. I mean, they're just sort of floating around. Sometimes all you can see is the blue thorax and the blue dot at the end of its abdomen. It almost looks like they're two separate dots just floating and you can't even see um, its abdomen around the edges of ponds. And so this is one of the species where the females come in various lovely, really beautiful color forms. And then we come to our pair of very common blue, all blue damselflies, which I mentioned earlier. So this is the azure. So um, Dave Smallshire, who created the, the bones of this presentation, he looks at them as a snooker player um, with the, um, this marking on segment, I think that's segment two, um, like a beer glass. This marking, sorry, all my, my arrows need to be moved over a bit, this bow tie. And then they're the ones with the little spur on their abdomen, like a snooker cue. I find the way I remember is the uh, you, they're as you are with a U, and that the, the, this um, shape is U shaped. And I, I find that the easiest thing to use to identify them. And also looking for the spur on the side if they're separate, and you have binoculars and you can see that little black mark. And um, here's the female, and you see she's also got that spur. They do tend to be more on the edge of water than common blue arnex species, which tend to fly more out over the water more, not be farther out in the water. So this is the common blue. Um, oh, another thing just, to, oh, well, I think we'll see another slide comparing the two. So it's got a, a broader blue stripe on the top of its thorax. Um, and it does not have that spur. And it's rather than having that U shape or beer glass shape, it's got an, um, an apple or club shape. Um, it's got more blue. Can't, yeah. I think mainly the, the, sh the apple or club shape, the lack of the spur, and then sort of the behavior. You will see them on the edge of ponds, but if you see something further out, it's more likely to be common blue. If you're doing a survey, like you're walking along, doing that, like, like we do butterfly transects, um, you can only record them as blue damselflies, or if you're confident enough and you have experience carefully netting, you can try to catch a sample of them and then work out a proportion. So here we see the comparison then, just going over those same features. Stripe on the top, the um, spur or no spur, and then the um, shape on the um, segment two. Sometimes there's a little, um, it's kind of a little join between two sections here that sometimes can look like a spur. But when you when when you see the spur on the azure, you can you can see the difference. Um, females, very variable. Um, the stripe on the thorax and the spur can tell them apart just just as easily though. Right, and here's our final damselfly we're going to look at. And it's the exception because they rest with their wings open. Um, in our part of the world, they're the only emerald damselfly we have, so they're unmistakable. Um, they have a really bright green thorax and abdomen, and then a very powdery blue markings. This is my animal I'm talking about um, on the top few segments and the bottom few segments of the abdomen. And that powdery blue is also called prunescence. It's like um, um, red grapes of that kind of cloudiness to them, it's that sort of coloration. Okay, everybody take a deep breath. We're gonna have another drink. And we're on to the dragonflies. So we'll start with those, the, the big, most largest, most powerful. So um, most of them are hawkers and there's a few other groups that are at uh, uh, G genera that are included in this group. So they're the large, robust, really active flyers. They have a long, relatively thin abdomen, and they tend to hawk up and down, um, around, around a pond, and then charge across the middle, and then around, 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 um, and up and down ditches. Also, you'll see them away from water, water feeding around 
uh, down, up and down paths and rides and even down roads sometimes. We've seen them a few times this summer. Um, and then it's these markings on their th top of their thorax, on their abdomens, and the overall markings of the abdomens are the features that we're looking at for these dragonflies. So here is our king and queen of the water body, the emperor. And um, if you can see, I've even got a prop. So that I think this is about twice life size to give you an idea. But they're one of our biggest dragonflies and they have a big chunky abdomen, um, which is one of the things that really helps me identify them because they're flying around very quickly. Um, but often you can see that and once, once you, you start seeing them with other hawkers, um, you can really tell the difference. And in that, that photo on the bottom left, you can see how big and chunky they are. They've got like one um, kind of black stripe down the center of their abdomen, which is a bit different as well. And very, very active. Flying rarely settles um, and can be in garden ponds of a reasonable size anywhere and they're very very territorial we've already seen the female cutting that slit in the vegetation and laying her egg on her own she's very green then the other thing this is actually our largest dragonfly the golden ring dragonfly and um, again it's unmistakable there's only one other black and yellow dragonfly called the common club tail which again used to be on the time the tally and recent surveys uh, i think maybe there's only one possible sighting, so we're not going to worry about them. So, black and yellow, big dragonfly, green eyes, it's golden rain. And they fly very far from their breeding um, water bodies, so you will see them all over the place. You see them in all sorts of damp grasslands in, in West Wales. Um, and they, they're very curious, they will come and look at you. Um, they like more acidic streams and rivers. Um, and you can see that amazing ovipositor just making sure that it's that i am yeah talking about the right thing yeah that's ovipositor so again the female will make a slit in vegetation to lay her eggs um another of our comes be so so most of our dragonflies are summer species so the hairy dragonfly which i mentioned another blue dragonfly which is only in kind of late may june uh the emperor comes out or overlaps with the um with the hairy but the rest of them tend to not turn up until july and they're definitely out and about now so we've got the migrant hawker this is the smallest of our big hawkers but that's you know hard to tell unless you see them with other with other species it looks just as it's flying it looks a bit darker it's got quite a lot of sort of brown um as well as blue on its abdomen tends to fly more around edges. Um, it's more approachable. And also sometimes you see them in feeding groups. I found them once in um, um, in Carmarthenshire. I was just stopped to have my lunch while I was doing a survey and there was this big swarm of uh, migrant hawkers just feeding, it's fabulous. Um, and, uh, sorry. Sometimes the um, zoom little information bar comes down and I can't see the top of the screen. So here we see the male closer up. He's got this golf tee shaped on his segment two, so yellow golf shape. And he's also got little, little um, green spots, but that's going to be hard um, to distinguish. But if you see it perched, that golf tee, it's the only species that has um, that feature. And you can see how it, yeah, its tail dips down a bit. The female, I can show you, go on to comments the hawker in a minute, but you can see these two females of these species are both brownish, but, but quite different markings of migrant hawker, darker brown. And here's a common hawker male. So he's got these noticeable stripes on the top of his thorax. Um, if you see him perched, you can see there's a bit, it, it, it's actually, his abdomen is narrowed and particularly this dark marking makes it look very narrow doesn't have that golf tee. It has these paired blue spots. And this is one of the few species that it does have this yellow costa, this vein on the top of its wings. Um, it's a much shyer dragonfly. Flies low over water. 
And that's a more of an upland species as well, and heathland species, acidic standing waters. Um, this is a very common species, more common than the common hawker, the southern hawker. Um, easy to identify because it's very green. We don't have any other dragonflies here like that. And it's got these really marked um, green stripes on the top of this thorax, paired green spots, some blue bands at the base. They're very wide ranging. They're the ones that I've seen flying down my lane um, just, just when they're out feeding. And then the female's very green. She's got those same stripes, very apple green, pretty indistinguishable as long as you get a good enough view, which is the, the hard thing with some of the dragonflies. Right, so that's our hawkers. Now we're gonna move on to the sort of smaller, chunkier dragonflies. So we've got the chasers. <clears throat> they have a favored perch and then they will chase out, they'll fly off and chase either an insect to grab to feed on or a female to mate with. They're medium size, um, tend to have fairly broad abdomens and they're either that pale prunescent blue or they're brown and yellow. Uh, male's very territorial. So four spotted chaser perches a lot. So you should get a chance to see and you can see that it's got, it's a bit, it should be actually be eight spot chaser, but I think it's saying four extra spots as well as the Terra stigma. Um, and it's also got this brown sort of armpits below on it, some lower pair of wings, brown with yellow markings. And our other common chaser is the broad body chaser. So that's very prunescent blue, really broad, dark wing bases, and it does have those little yellow spots on the side, but it's just seeing that broad blue. Um, help you. We'll go on to some other the skimmers that also have that same prunescent blue, but they're much slimmer. And then the female, who um, you possibly can mistake for a four spotted chaser, but she doesn't have the four spots. So you're okay there. Right, so the skimmers, as I mentioned, so um, the males are all that same prunescent blue, the females are yellowy. They're slimmer than chasers, um, and they skim low over the water, but they also perch um, on low vegetation, also on the ground, you'll see them perched um, on open kind of wall, you know, to get the, the, their, their warming themselves out. So they'll perch on, um, you know, sandy or uh, bare ground. And one thing you'll find with the garden pond is you'll get some of these species that like to bask on bare ground early. And then as your pond vegetates up, you won't get them as much. Again, the males are very territorial. The, um, Females overpulse it on their own, but the male will, will be nearby to, to protect her or protect himself, protect his sperm from other males. Um, so it's our the color and the pattern on their abdomen is the key to tell them apart. So we've got the black tailed skimmer, which has a black tail, so pretty easy. It's also got, uh, I struggled to get a good picture, but it's got this sort of dark um, uh, upper segments as well and very pale. Um, not even yellow, kind of brownish spots, but the um, the blue prunescence of the black tip tells you it's a black tailed skimmer. Its name helps you. Um, similar, very similar species is a keeled skimmer. So it's actually hard again hard to get a good photo. It's actually got a keel like a boat, like a, a ridge along um, its abdomen, and you can see it, or you can see it as a black stripe, and it doesn't have a black tip. So um, that's your um, difference. And they're both um, kind of heathland wetland species, but particularly keeled skimmer is more restricted to wet heathland and mires with sphagnum mosses. And then the females are both yellow, but, you can, but they have very different patterns. So black-tailed skimmer has like a ladder pattern, whereas, um, the keel skimmer has more a dark line down the center rather than along the sides with these cross bars. Okay, we're getting there, finally to our darters. So they're the smallest of the dragonflies, quite chunky and quite a slender abdomen. Again, they return to favorite, favored perches and you can just sit and you can approach them quite closely. And I love them because you can really see 
see them looking around and, and looking for predator, for a prey and looking for um, females and you know they look at you they know you're there and as long as they don't think you're a threat they'll stay there and if they fly off with all of these perchers they fly off just stand and wait because they um, will often come back to the same perch and you can also if you have a garden pond you can just put a, a stick out at an angle um, and often then they, they will come and perch on that so you can get a good look on them and like all of these as I mentioned they like to bask on warm like colored surfaces um, some of them fly very late in the year, and you'll see them on um, wooden railings and things like that. The wetland center in October, if you go, there's a few um, little bridges with wooden, wooden um, railings, and they're always covered in common darters just hanging out and trying to get a bit of the autumn sun and flattening themselves against the warm surface to warm up. Um, so we've already seen common darter. So here it is again. So the male's quite a, a red, just slightly orangey red. A female more uh, muted colors. Very common everywhere. One of our late, later species to emerge. And as I said, flies very late. I think they've been recorded as late as December now. Um, ruddy darter is very similar. Um, it does have um, a waist. Uh, you can see it more in the female where it kind of um, comes in and out again. But that's, that can be very hard to see in the field. And it's also got, um, it, it also is a more bright um, scarlet red, but that's not always easy to see. Um, and they're not as common as common dark deer, but they definitely are in our area. Oh. Bit tricky to tell the difference. The, the real key feature is whether they have a pale stripe on their legs, the common darter, or they have all black legs um, in the ready darter. I mean, sometimes really brightly fresh colored ones are much easier to tell apart the males, but as they age, then, then the colors are harder to distinguish. And then, very similar shape, um, black darter. It's all black, nothing else like it. That's more an upland species as well, acidic pools and ditches. Um, lady or continental birds. Um, there's also, you'll also get dragonflies coming in. So we both get new species that are starting to arrive, but also resident species are, um, what's the word, you know, added to, it's not the right word, but um, um, you get more of um, native, uh, uh, of our native species also um, coming in from the continent. And um, insects, I think we're just learning about insect migration. There's a, a really interesting talk that's on the Field Studies Council um, YouTube page now about insect migration by a uh, PhD student at Exeter called Will Hawks. And he didn't mention dragonflies, but it'd be interesting to find out from him if he's recorded them. He's recorded huge numbers of all sorts of insects. This thing we don't think of as being migratory. Millions of individuals. Right. So I'm going to take a deep breath and have a drink. As we come on to the last section, just very briefly about ponds. So, like all our um, important habitats, we've lost so so many ponds <clears throat> over the last hundred, hundred and twenty years. Most British species will breed in ponds, but some of them need very large ponds. But you will get even in a small pond, you'll get a, a good range of species. Obviously, the bigger the better, but small ponds are just as important, or if you can, maybe a number of small ponds, and you will get that succession. Of, you'll get some um, some species when your pond is young and you don't, and it's not so vegetated, and then they'll disappear, but other species will start appearing. So dig a pond if you don't have one, and it's just such a fabulous way to watch dragonflies and learn about dragonflies, and you actually maybe catch one actually emerging, or you see the tenorals that recently emerged. Um, hanging around on the vegetation or near the pond, um, and you 
So you do want to keep them away from um, anything that's going to cause nutrient enrichment, like leaves falling from trees. And also, they do need sunny ponds. Shaded and temporary ponds that dry out are important for other animals and plants, but um, dragonflies need that sun. And I'm mainly talking about garden plants ponds but it just occurred to me last night if you if you want to put a pond in your in your fields if you if you own some land just make sure you don't put it somewhere that's already got um wildlife value for other species i visited lots, uh, quite a few people that have said oh we really want a pond we were going to put it here maybe the wettest bit which turns out to be like the marsh fertility habitat so do think about where you put it and obviously you want to you know you, you want to put it where it's going to collect water and the amphibian and reptile conservation, who I will talk about in a minute, I'm not sure, they've got a new project, which is obviously um, a bit on hold at the moment, but they do um, organize getting ponds dug um, for landowners. I'm not sure if it covers West Wales, but definitely have, have a look at their website and um, see what you can find out. Right, so anywhere you wanna make sure the polluted water can enter, like run off from roads or um, especially adjacent fields, fertilized fields, and also from streams. You don't want any, um, any, any of that coming into your pond because you're bound to get um, nutrients and also invasive species, Himalayan balsam, Japanese knotweed, and all those things that travel by streams. Um, fill it with rainwater. You really don't want to use tap water because that's full of um, chlorine and other chemicals. If you, if you can't avoid then make sure you fill buckets with rainwater and, and leave them for a while so the chlorine, some of the chlorine can evaporate. And also if you want to top up your pond, same, same thing applies. No fish, no ducks, because they will not only eat the larvae, but they will cause nutrient enrichment, reducing the oxygen, dragonflies and all the other pond inhabitants won't be able to breathe. Um, so, Ideally, allow your pond to colonize naturally because the things that grow in your area will naturally colonize it and they'll be, they'll be happy there. Um, if there aren't ponds around you and you do want to plant, then you need to make sure you, you buy a um, range of um, structures. As I said before, it's the structure of the plants that, you, that matter rather than specific species. So you need emergent vegetation on the edge for them to climb up um, and be able to emerge and then also to perch. And often they'll lay their eggs in the base, um, emperors and, and species like that. Floating vegetation, they'll rest there. A few of the um, like red-eyed damselflies actually defend territories on any anything floating from gunk to water lilies. Um, they lay eggs underneath. Um, and then submerged vegetation, which again is important for the larvae and um, some of the species lay eggs in them and also to keep your, your pond healthy and oxygenated and also some open water. So you want all those, all those features. Um, if you do buy plants, make sure they're native plants and definitely native species and have local provenance from your area. Um, I had a look and I couldn't really find any local um, aquatic plant suppliers that um, you know I could guarantee. If you if you do want to buy, do as much research as you can. Speak to speak to the garden supplier, the plant supplier, to make sure they are actually British grown species, and find out um, their biosecurity policy so that you're not because the the risk is introducing unwanted species. So I think I got some um, soft rush in my pond, which may have come from a, a plant I bought, um, or um, diseases and um, invasive species, which we'll go on to in a minute. So very, there's a lot, uh, again, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a few um, links to find out. There's lots of advice online about how to design your pond. The key things are make sure the slides are gently sloping so you can get in and out. Um, with shallow edges and then deeper in the middle. Um, and also things like um, around the sides, so stones, wood, moss for those, those basking dragonflies. Um, they do need some sunny shelter away from the ponds or hedges or tall vegetation and the, the um, tenor 
um, dragonflies and damselflies will go off to taller vegetation to just sort of um, try to be discreet so that they're not going uh, to avoid predation. Um, so I guess I'll biosecurity, I mentioned there are a number of really nasty invasive species that are really, really, really difficult to remove. Again, Brian and the other people from the Wetland Center can tell you all about that. So I would not recommend getting plants or water from your friend's pond because you don't know what you're introducing and don't and only use pond nets in one pond. Make sure you clear, clean, you clear. It should say clean your boots, your wellies, and your nets, and dry them in the sun. Um, be careful about invasive species, and also just large things. If you've got a small pond, lilies are just going to take over your pond. Um, and yeah, be wary of garden centers. Um, and also, it's really important, biosecurity is so important, because our amphibians are um, suffering from a number of diseases, and they can definitely get transferred between ponds. Um, ma maintenance from reservation is a really tricky thing. I always find it really hard. I always miss the window. September, October is a recommended size of time when um, things are so active enough that they can get at it. Don't clear the whole thing at once because then suddenly you're going to lose lots and lots of species. You can also um, uh, net like things like newts, mostly are out of the pond by then, but there still will be. Um, animals like that around, so you might actually want to net them, put them in a bucket or put them carefully if you can. Um, and ideally, it's, it's true with, with um, just as true as like a, he a hedge cutting, only do a third of the time. Don't use any herbicides in or around your pond. And it is important to keep um, keep the sunny side open, uh, the vegetation around the, on the sunny side open so the sun is getting in. Right, so we'll send you this, all these resources. So, um, well, I didn't find specific um, aquatic plant suppliers. The National Botanic Saving Pollinators Assurance Scheme, a brilliant thing, where they're certifying um, suppliers of native, native grown plants that have not used herbicides and have not been grown in peat. So we'll send you that. So, suppliers that have signed up that provide bog plants, so pond edge plants, and um, as it's only just been launched, so I'm sure there'll be more and more um, suppliers joining up, so have a look at that. And that's it. I'm going to stop for now. If somebody's really interested in our rarer and more difficult to identify species, I do have some more slides, but I think that's enough for everybody's brains and for my throat.